What's cracking guys? In this video, I'm continuing on with the diffusion model track in the machine learning coding series. And in this one, I'll be covering Glide. So that's a model that was a precursor to DALI 2 uh, coming from uh, OpenAI. And I've previously covered the paper in great depth. So if you wanna have a deep dive into the paper itself, you can check it out. I'm gonna link it somewhere here. But in this video, I'll obviously be focusing on, on analyzing, understanding the code. I have three Jupyter notebooks prepared for you guys, and so we'll be going through those. Uh, so what I've done is, as always, I just um, I've downloaded, I've, I've cloned the repo here. Uh, you can find it. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of link it in the video description. Uh, but before we go there, uh, I first want to walk you through the paper uh, as usually just to give you uh, all of the necessary context hopefully that's going to be like 10-15 minutes quick overview compared to the deep dive i've already previously made so without further ado let's start uh, understanding how glide works and um, then we'll we'll start uh, doing the, the coding part cool so uh, first things first, uh, as I said, Glide is a precursor to uh, like a DALI model. Uh, so they mentioned here, when evaluated by human judges, our samples are preferred to those from DALI. So this is the version one. 87% uh, of the time when evaluated for photorealism and 69% of the time when evaluated for caption similarity. Uh, the DALI version one actually did not even use diffusion models, uh, but DALI 2 did, and it built directly upon Glide. So yeah, we're slowly building our way uh, towards more complex models. Cool, you can see the, some of the images here. Uh, again, here, instead of uh, compared to uh, my previous video where I showed you the guided DDPM uh, model where you can, could condition uh, but using only uh, like a class, uh, for example, ImageNet class. Here, uh, Glide can actually cope with text, with natural language, so that's much, much cooler. And you can see some very cool examples here, like a, a corgi wearing a red bow tie and a purple party hat. You can see that like, you can composite uh, different concepts together in a plausible way. You can uh, bind attributes such as uh, a purple party hat uh, to, to certain objects and red bow tie. So it's a fairly uh, powerful uh, model. And as I said, it, it was a precursor to DALI 2, and we all know what DALI 2 can now make. Uh, aside from uh, image generation, it can also do image uh, in painting. You can see here, you put a mask here, and then you set some uh, natural language prompt here, zebras roaming in the field, and out comes an image that's modified. Similarly here, a girl hugging a corgi on a pedestal, you can see how this uh, dog here is, is uh, swapped by a corgi. Etc. Etc. You can see a bunch of examples there. So the model itself stands for guided language to image diffusion for generation and editing. So generation is the uh, the part that we all know about, and editing is the in painting part. Cool. So there is now this background about DDPM. So I'm going to skip all of that because uh, hopefully you watched some of my previous videos. Uh, this one is going to build uh, heavily upon those. So do check out the whole series if you haven't so far. Uh, you can also iteratively uh, do this image in painting. So you can see here how slowly they're adding. The they first add the Corgi image, then they add the table here, then they add the ways here, et cetera, et cetera. So you can kind of iteratively uh, improve your images. Uh, okay, so the parts on which I want to focus on in this video are mostly about clip guidance and classifier free guidance. So I want to focus on those, and I'll probably, if I have enough time, focus on in painting as well. So um, without further ado, let's first introduce the classifier free guidance. So in the previous video, we saw how we can do classifier uh, based guidance where you use a pre-trained uh, well classifier and you use its gradients. So, so the classifier was trained on noisy images. That's an important detail. And then you just use the gradients from that classifier to kind of guide uh, your, your uh, class conditional uh, diffusion generation. Uh, here, the cool thing about classifier free guidance is you do not have to train a separate classifier on pre-trained on noisy images. Uh, it's it's much easier and uh, and thus better. Okay, so let me try to briefly explain how classifier free guidance works. Again, um, as I just mentioned, this method does not require a separate classifier. That's a big plus for for this method compared to the classifier guidance. Uh, and then they say here, so for classifier free guidance the label in a class conditional diffusion model is replaced with a null label with a fixed probability during training. Uh, this is, I think, usually 10 or 20%. Uh, during sampling, the output of the model is extrapolated further in the direction of 
uh, the class conditional model and away from the null conditional model, uh, like so. And you can see here the expression. We basically have the, the, the one where we condition on, those, on, the, on the null label, let's call it that way. Uh, and then we just add uh, this, this basically this difference between the class conditional and the null conditional. And we just use this guidance scale, so the parameter s, to uh, well to 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 modulate how much we want to go in in that direction and how I think about this uh, in my head the mental model I have is basically you have um, this thing here tells you gives you the the noise in the unconditional case so it's gonna hit, give you some noise in, some it's gonna be some point in the n dimensional space where n is basically the number of uh, dimensions in your image so the resolution times the number of channels uh, and uh, so now. Once you have that point, uh, you then plot this point of where the model thinks uh, the um, class conditional uh, noise should be. So if it outputs point like here, then you can form the vector by just kind of subtracting one from another and you get something like this. And then uh, what, uh, what this final expression is gonna be about is, okay, the model outputs the uh, null conditioned uh, noise and it's here. And we know that if you want to move towards that particular class on, upon which we are conditioning, we need to move in this direction. And because of that, we just add that vector uh, and we modulate it with, a, with the scalar S to uh, basically, well, to, to start generating images that are from that particular class. So that's the, I literally have a geometric interpretation. Uh, now, whether this is uh, completely correct or not, uh, I don't know, but like, I think, I think it, it does sound like a, like a good uh, mental model. In any case, Let's now see how we can replace uh, the simple labels by the natural language because that's what we care about when it comes to um, uh, to Glide. So what what they do is so to implement classifier free guidance with generic text prompts, we sometimes replace text captions with an empty sequence, which we also refer to as this uh, well zero crossed I guess uh, during the training. Uh, we then guide towards the caption using the modified prediction, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so you can see that everything remains the same except that we are now conditioning on caption uh, like and not on the simple label. And that's pretty much it. So uh, the second thing they do is they use clip for guidance because here you cannot have like a thousand classes or whatnot because language is obviously has infinite uh, possibilities of of, of compositing uh, and yeah there is infinite number of, of sentences I guess um, so you have to use something like clip and the only difference compared to the classifier guidance we saw in the previous video is that here you're looking for a gradient of the dot product between the caption and the image so let me read this for you uh, perturbing the re uh, so when applied to diffusion models these techniques are similar to classifier guidance perturbing the reverse process mean along the gradient of the text image dot product with respect to the image okay so what that means is basically if you recall how we how we've done the classifier guidance we output um, like a mean and then on top of that we shift that mean by the uh, scale version of the um, covariance matrix times the gradient of our classifier. So now the only thing that dif differs in this in this uh, clip guidance is that this these gradients here, because we're now dealing with text and not with, with classes, are gonna be this thing here. So basically, you encode a certain caption and you wanna make sure, you want to find, you, you wanna learn how to tweak the input image such that such that the uh, dot product between the image feature from that image and the uh, text uh, embedding here is maximized. Uh, and that means that the image is belonging more and more to that class. Or differently said, it's, it's, it's becoming better and better described by that particular caption. So that's, that's all, like, that's a small tweak that we have to make uh, in order to, to make the, the, the clip thing and the text uh, uh, conditioning uh, to work. Again, let me just quickly draw a picture here. It might be a bit easier to understand. So we have an input image here and we have our clip model here. Okay, so here is clip. So now we now have some type of a, of a prompt, like I don't know, like maybe something simple like a dog. Okay, so we encode that thing 
we pass it through the clip. Again, we pass it through clip here. Uh, so th this same model basically, and out comes out comes some some embedding here. So this is going to be an embedding that corresponds to this prompt here. Uh, next up, we pass the image through the clip, and we get a different embedding here. Okay, this is going to be the image embedding. Let me maybe choose a different color just for the sake of um, like not to com in order not to confuse this. So here we have a prompt. Uh, for the um, so we have the, the text embedding and here we have the image embedding and now the gradients are going to tell us How we should tweak the image? How should we tweak the image such that this? Vector is much closer in the uh, image text embedding space Okay, hopefully that was clear enough uh, now. Let me briefly tell you a couple of things about their training. So they mentioned here for our main experiments, we train a 3.5 billion parameter text conditional diffusion model at 64 times 64 resolution, and another 1.5 billion parameter text conditional upsampling diffusion model to increase the resolution to 256 times 256. For clip guidance, we also train a noise aware 64 times 64 VAT clip model. Okay, so the only difference compared to the previous video uh, on the uh, guided DDPMs is basically here we have additional transformer that's going to be used to text condition our diffusion model instead of just uh, d doing a simple class conditioning. Uh, it's not that like big of a difference, to be honest. Um, so a couple more details here. Uh, to condition on the text, we first encode it into a sequence of K tokens uh, and feed these tokens into transformer model. Okay, the output of this transformer is used in two ways. So first, the final token embedding is used in place of a class embedding in the ADM model. So that's the model from the previous paper. Again, the paper is called, I think, uh, Diffusion Models Beat GANs on Image Synthesis. Uh, and second, the last layer of token embeddings, a sequence of K feature vectors, is separately projected to the dimensionality of each attention layer throughout the ADM model, so Diffusion Model, and then concatenated to the attention context at each layer. Okay, so that's how we integrate this textual conditioning information into the ADM, into the diffusion model. That's an additional detail I want you to understand. Okay, um, finally here they mention how, like let, let me read this for you. So after the initial training run, we fine tuned our base models to support unconditional image generation. This training procedure is exactly like pre-training, except 20% of, uh, of text token sequences are replaced with the empty sequence. This way the model retains its ability to generate text conditional outputs, but can also generate images unconditionally. And we need this uh, ability su su such that we can, uh, well, use the, 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 basically the classifier free guidance effectively. Okay, guys, that's pretty much it. I'm gonna skip everything else. Uh, again, the results uh, are basically better when we use uh, classifier free guidance compared to uh, clip guidance. So that's one of the reasons this is so cool. Um, I'm gonna skip all of this. This is not that vital. And finally, uh, worth mentioning, the only model that they've open sourced is the so-called uh, Glide filtered, where they say here, we filtered our training images containing people to reduce the ca uh, capabilities of the model in many people-centric problematic use cases. Uh, the model is also way smaller compared to their biggest version, and they also uh, filter out some other images such as uh, like hate symbols, etc., etc. Okay, So just worth having that in mind. Uh, finally, the model such as Glide uh, was still struggling a lot with with certain, um, well, let's call it uh, weird phrases, whereas Dali 2 became much better with these. Uh, still not perfect, but, but better than, than, than what Glide could achieve. Here we can see an example, a mouse hunting a lion, and we can see that the model does, does not know uh, the dire does not understand the direction. So here it appears as if the lion was hunting the mouse and not the other way around. So it understands the association, but not the, the, the causal relationship here. Cool. Okay, that's pretty much it. Now let's go back to the code. Let's understand how this looks in actual code. Okay, I'm gonna first start with uh, this simple clip guided script. So we're gonna use the, the clip, the pre-trained clip model uh, on, on that's like noise aware. Uh, and we're gonna use it to, to guide our, our uh, generation. So let me run this thing. And again, I'm, as usually, I'm gonna skip over 
everything that's not core to understanding what I'm trying to explain in a particular script here, we want to understand how clip is used to guide the generation process. So um, we just grab the device. It's, I'm, I'm going to have I have a GPU, so it's going to be a, a GPU here. Um, some options, default options for the model and diffusion. We saw this in the first video, like they're obviously reusing a lot of the code, uh, which is a good thing. And so I'm, I'm going to skim across all of this. So time a step respacing. So what it does is uh, if the model was trained on like 1000 uh, steps, uh, you can now um, instead during the sampling procedure have only 100 steps and still get good results, good uh, high quality samples. Uh, then we're going to form the uh, model and the diffusion here. Uh, so model is basically a unit model and diffusion is contains all of the constants that are necessary for the diffusion. Okay, so we'll need to step into this part because the model is a bit different compared to previous papers. So the model now contains also the transformer because of the text conditioning. So let's see how that looks like. Uh, diffusion itself looks pretty much the same as in previous videos. So I'm going to skip over that. But we're going to uh, jump into this create model function. Let me just hit uh, F5. And let's get into the uh, function itself. Uh, okay, so um, a couple of details here, depending on the image size, we're going to set up the unit in a particular way, uh, number number of channels is going to be different compared to depending on the image resolution. Again, we've seen this multiple times, and they just have these attention um, blocks for particular resolutions, not that important. And finally, we are going to have this text to image unit. So again, it's just a simple unit plus the transformer. That's everything that glide uh, changed compared to previous uh, papers. Okay, uh, now we're going to form the text to image unit here. Uh, there is a lot of parameters. I don't want to uh, explain every single one of those. There is also the encoder part. I'm going to quickly show you what this is. Basically, they have a pre-trained uh, BPE encoder that are going that they are going to use. Uh, and I explained this in the OpenAI clip um, video. So I'm going to link it somewhere here. You can check it out if you want to understand a bit better what's going on here, uh, how the actual tokenization works, how that magic looks like. Uh, then you can check out that video. But here I'm just going to skip all of that and hit F5 to enter the constructor of the text to image unit. Okay, so let's see what's different here. We call the constructor of the super class and that's going to be just a simple unit model. I'm not going to um, show you the unit because we already saw that in previous videos. As I said, I'm, I have to kind of depend on previous videos because otherwise this would be three or four hours long video. I, I kid you not. Uh, okay, so we construct the uh, we construct the um, unit model here. I'm gonna skip over everything here. I'm just gonna hit F5, and we have our um, unit constructed. Let's go outside here, and now so this is the diff the different part compared to previous papers. They have a transformer, so they form a transformer that has a particular context, so 128 tokens, a certain width, 512. Uh, dimensions, number of layers, 16, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, then they have, they use some layer norm, not that important, they create some token embedding layer here. So this one is basically going to embed our tokens uh, into a certain, uh, well, into a certain uh, uh, vector space. And then we also have positional embeddings, uh, we don't need more than 128, because that's going to be the max context that this, this transformer is going to use. And we finally have this transformer projection linear layer. We're going to see how that one is used a bit later. Okay. Finally, there is this uh, padding embedding. We'll see how that all fits together a bit later. Okay. So cache stuff, not that vital. I'm going to skip all of that. And finally, I'm going to skip the diffusion uh, model because we, we've seen that already. I'll, I'll have to skip this. And here we are. So again, we have a unit with transformer. And we have our diffusion uh, model here. So basically those two together form, form a diffusion model. Okay, let's go back uh, into the main script. Uh, we just do some, some uh, boilerplate for machine learning, just some conversion to FP16. Uh, we put the model onto GPU, we load uh, the actual weights, 
and then we print the number of parameters here. Okay, we repeat the same thing for the uh, upsampling model. I'm going to skip all of this because we will not be focusing on the upsampling model. So I'm going to kind of skip over all of this until we get back into the main script. I should have toggled off the, the, the um, breakpoints, but yeah, I guess next time. Cool. I think we are there almost. Uh, basically, okay, so, so we, we created the upsampling model. Now we create the clip model, okay? Let's see how clip looks like. So clip, as you can see here, I'm gonna just step into here. Uh, we grab some uh, default config path. So they have this config YAML file that specifies certain properties of our uh, model, so of the clip model. So you can see it here. Again, too many details to, to cover. I'm just gonna uh, continue on execution in the, in the create clip function. So here we are. Uh, we create a simple tokenizer. So clip will have a different, a bit different tokenizer uh, compared to the diffusion model. Um, again, we can treat it as a black box uh, for all practical purposes. Okay. <clears throat> now, as I already said, I covered clip in one of the previous videos. So if you really want to understand how the code works and how clip works, do check it out or, or also check out my paper uh, video on clip. I, I've done that as well. I can link those somewhere here. We can briefly jump into the text encoder. Let me see whether I have um, uh, basically, okay. So let's kind of, let me let me quickly show you how this text encoder is gonna look like. Um, nothing important here. I'm gonna skip some parts. So they just form the uh, causal mask here because, um, well, does that make sense? Yeah, it does because we are here dealing with, with text. But then again, we are not generating text. So I guess you could use um, bi-directional, you could, you could use non-causal masks as well here. But in any case, let me kind of skim over all of this. Uh, so now they start uh, stacking these blocks. The first block is just gonna be a text embedding block, which means you're gonna take tokens and then you're gonna embed them into certain space. Uh, I think I'm gonna show you this in the, in the I'm gonna just put a, uh, well, I don't want to even put a breakpoint here. It's just a simple embedding layer. I'm going to skip that. Um, and then they form, they, they add a bunch of transformer blocks. And then at the end, they just extract the uh, basically embedding uh, that's uh, above the last token in the sequence. So that's how clip works. Uh, I'm going to have to skip all of that and let's continue. So we have the text encoders. Basically, it's a simple transformer. Uh, it first embeds the tokens, then it processes them using the transformer uh, blocks. And then at the end, it just extracts, uh, as I said, the last embedding. That's it. Um, next up, we have image encoder. Image encoder is VAT, so it's, they're using vision transformer. Um, again, I'll have to uh, just treat this as a black box. Let me see whether there's something interesting here. Uh, um, okay, this time they're using a non-causal mask, as you can see here, which makes sense for images. Um, let's see what else. So again, similar structure, they form these blocks. The first one is gonna be image embedding. So we're gonna basically do the patchify uh, like layer of the VAT, which means you're gonna treat image as a bunch of patches and then you're gonna uh, embed those patches into certain, into certain uh, uh, well, vector space. And then you're gonna just uh, treat those as tokens. And then it's pretty much the same as, as if you were to just use transformer. And you can see here, they do have a bunch of transformer blocks. And at the end, they have image feature extractor that's going to, um, basically extract let me just see what's going on there okay we're gonna i'm gonna put a like a simple um breakpoint in the floral function so we're gonna see that a bit later once we start using clip actually okay so that's it we have the image encoder we have the text encoder we form this logic scale uh, that's a learnable uh, parameter we might see how it's used a bit later and finally they form the actual clip model so it has a bunch of uh helper functions um, what we care about is, well, for now, the, I can just keep the init function that's not that important. We're going to see everything a bit later uh, during the actual forward pass. Okay, so now we just lo load the, the checkpoints for the image encoder. We load the checkpoint for the text encoder. This is where the actual fun starts. Um, we're going to take the prompt and oil painting of a corgi. We're going to encode that and we're going to generate an image. Uh, that's gonna have, uh, that's gonna be well described by this prompt. 
Uh, so the guidance scale is gonna be three. So that's the S parameter that we use to multiply the gradients coming from the clip model. Uh, we have the, some temperature that's not that important. And now we just tokenize, again, we're gonna treat this as a black box. We take the prompt and we tokenize it using the diffusion models uh, tokenizer into tokens, okay? So let me show you how that thing is gonna look like. It's gonna be, as you can see here, uh, like there is seven tokens in total. And then there's this special utility function that's gonna just pad uh, the, these tokens such that we fill in the context for the transformer uh, that's a part of the, our diffusion model. Okay, let me show you what uh, that means. In practice, that means we're gonna have, I think we are using 128. So that's this uh, text context uh, uh, parameter. So basically if I were to uh, print the number of tokens, you can see there is 128 tokens now and the mask just tells you which ones uh, are actually legit. And the first seven ones are actually true tokens. Everything else is just padding, which is specified by setting false for all of those other tokens. Okay, so, so the reason we're doing this is so that we can basically take multiple prompts and do this in a single forward pass. Uh, and that's why we kind of pad to a fixed dimension. Okay, so now we form this model um, keyword arguments dictionary. We just store the token, so batch size is just one, so that means we're gonna, we won't do anything smart here. We just store the tokens and the mask, and this is gonna be later used to condition uh, the diffusion model. We're gonna see that in a second, okay? So there's this condition function. I'm just gonna uh, enable basically all of the breakpoints, and this is gonna, we're gonna hit this uh, function a bit later. It's gonna be very important. Uh, we are actually going to have to enter this function. So let me click F10 and enter this one. So we're gonna form this, uh, well, basically the embedding for the prompts. And then we're gonna return the con uh, this conditioning function, okay? So let's see what's gonna happen here. So we just basically pass prompts through the um, textual pathway of the clip model. Nothing fancy there. We've seen this multiple times. We've seen this in my previous uh, clip video. So uh, we've called this encode prompts. Uh, that's just going to, as you can see here, iterate through the list of prompts. We only have a single prompt, so nothing fancy will happen there. We're gonna treat the tokenizer as a black box, so this is gonna return us some sequence of tokens. Let me, let me show you what uh, we're gonna get here. So if I run this, we have, like as you can see here, six tokens. And then we're gonna call again this padded tokens and length function, which is going to just pad uh, everything uh, Okay, uh, I kind of entered here. Let me just skip over this. We don't want to go there. Uh, so again, we end up with these sub tokens, which are going to be just padded versions. Whoops. So if I just grab the sub tokens here, and if I print this, you can see we have the, the same tokens as above. Hmm. For some reason, there is some difference here. Let me just see. Oh, no. Okay. We, we, we have the start. Uh, of, of sentence token here and the end of sentence token here and we have our tokens here and then we have additionally the padding. So it's a bit different. As I said, uh, Clip has a bit different tokenizer compared to uh, the uh, tokenizer that we have in our diffusion model. And now we're just gonna append that and we are done. We just convert it to torch tensors and we are back here. So now we have basically tokens and um, their associated lengths. Next up, we're going to uh, pass these tokens uh, through the uh, text pathway. So that's again, just gonna embed the tokens, then uh, apply a bunch of transformer blocks, and ultimately we are gonna extract uh, a particular, a particular uh, token. So let's see how the, the extractor part works. So again, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the forward pass of our, uh, of our text encoder and we don't care about most of these parts because that's just gonna do, as I said, just gonna do the embedding and then number of transformer blocks. And ultimately we'll have this, uh, I think this is the part that we care about. L let's see how this is gonna work. So we call the text extractor here. And here it is, so the text feature extractor. Let's see what it does. Uh, basically, as you can see here, text length tells us how big, how many tokens do we have uh, fed into the uh, transformer and it's gonna be equal to seven. So that tells you that that's the index of the last token and then we just gather. So we let me show you what text is. So text is, uh, 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 if I print 
shape here. So we have 77 tokens. Some of uh, those tokens are obviously padding. Some of those tokens are start and end of sentence tokens. And 512 is just the dimensionality. So what we do by, by doing the getter, we are basically gonna extract the last token here. So that means we're gonna extract the uh, seventh uh, the the uh, well the eighth token. Let's step over there and let me convince you that that's indeed the case. If I were to take the text and then if I were to take the seventh uh, here and let's take the first three elements, you can see them here. And now let's let me show you the uh, let me just see what the shape of this thing is. Okay, so let's now take zero zero and let's take also first three elements and those, yeah, as you can see, these are the same because we literally just extracted whatever the embeddings are on top of that seventh token. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, and finally, we uh, pass that X through the uh, layer norm. And finally, we just return the, basically the mapped version of, of that particular token. So let's see what F is. I think it's just a simple, yeah, Fine is just a, uh, basically a simple linear layer um, with some tweaks, but I will not get into those details because as you can imagine, this is a very huge uh, code base and I cannot cover everything. Um, okay, so let's go outside here and we end up with H being what? H shape is gonna be 1512. So we have a single token uh, that is supposed to be a representation of our input prompt. Okay, continuing on here just on search and that's it. We have our ZT token, so that's the same thing. So again, 1512 and we're gonna now normalize it just using the, uh, well, I guess this is just L2 norm uh, as as previously, uh, in, as we've seen previously in the uh, OpenAI clip video. Okay, so that's the ZT, uh, ZT and now we return this con function. I have a breakpoint here, so we're gonna see it a bit later when the time comes. Uh, but for now, let's continue on with the main script. Short recap, because this was fairly overwhelming potentially. So we formed our diffusion models and we loaded the actual checkpoints here. We can ignore the sampling model. Then we, mo we loaded the clip model. We have a prompt and we basically encoded that prompt here. We have a mask and tokens for that prompt. And now we, we ended up uh, creating this, this embedding vector for our prompt using the clip model. Okay, so that's it. Now we're gonna go through the P sample loop. So that's gonna be the uh, reverse process of our diffusion model. Uh, let's see what we're gonna do here. We wanna generate an image that's gonna be of this particular resolution. So that's gonna be of 6464 RGB. Uh, and um, let's see what's interesting here. We're gonna use the tokens and mask to condition the model. So that's gonna be different compared to our previous videos uh, with DDPMs. Uh, in any case, let's now um, jump into this P sample loop. Um, again, I kind of skipped the um, P sample loop because everything it does is just that, uh, basically iterates through this, this function loop progressive and starts generating multiple samples. Um, but I think we, we are generating just a single sample so that it doesn't even matter. So we can just kind of skip over all of this. And now the, the actual fun starts. So we start as, we, as you may know from the uh, completely uh, like a normal distribution and we just sample our image from a normal distribution. That means we have initially completely noisy image and then we're gonna slowly work our way from there uh, and denoise that image until we get the image that corresponds to the prompt that we uh, are using for this for this program. Okay, so we'll have a hundred uh, steps uh, of the reverse process uh, and just some TQDM stuff uh, for, for uh, monitoring the progress, but we're gonna now do hundred times in order to, hundred denoising steps so that we end up with an image, okay? So initially T is gonna be 99, as you can see here, and now the whole fun happens in this p sample function. So we're gonna pass a diffusion model. So that's unit with transformer. We're gonna pass the noisy image, the time step, uh, and a couple of other uh, basically uh, parameters here. And let's see how p sample is gonna look like. Okay, so this is the funny part. Okay, here let's see how the text information is used to condition the model. That's gonna be the interesting part. 
Okay, let me uh, step into here. So that's gonna be, again, that's gonna be uh, uh, um, the text to image unit. And what we're going to do is first, we're gonna embed the, the, the time steps. So first sinusoidal embeddings, and then we just map them using simple linear layers here. And this is the interesting and different part. We're going to pass the tokens and the mask through the transformer part of our, um, what's the name again of this thing, uh, 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 text to image unit. So let's see how that thing is gonna look like. Let me set a breakpoint here. So it's gonna be simply a transformer. So I, I don't think anything fancy will happen here. We get the embeddings, we do the positional encoding, blah, blah, blah. We apply the transformer here. Let me just see whether there is something interesting. Uh, uh, um, okay, so here is the interesting part. We are returning, as you recall from the paper, not just like the embedding for the last token, we're also returning all of the tokens, all of the embedding vectors from the previous layer uh, or something like that. Let me just see what exactly is going on here. So we passed it through the transformer, we get this uh, XF out, and um, then we apply this uh, layer norm. And as you can see here, uh, so let me just show you the, the shape of XF out first. So the shape of this thing is gonna be 128, 512, okay? And so we are going to do the following. We're gonna take the last token and then map it using this transformer projection layer. And that's gonna be simply, I assume, yeah, a linear layer, okay? And that's how we add, uh, We end up with uh, XF proj projection, which is gonna be 11512 in shape, I assume. Let me just verify that's indeed the case. No, it's because the linear layer has, actually has a different output dimensionality, that's why we end up with 768. Not that important, but in any case. Uh, and uh, we take here, we just do some uh, permutation, but we take all of the tokens and that's the part from the paper. So let me, again, this is gonna be 512 tokens. And this is the part we saw in the paper. Let me, let me show you uh, somewhere here. They mentioned it. So the output of this transformer is used in two ways. First, the final token embedding is used in place of a class embedding in the, in the ADM model. Second, the last layer of token embeddings, a sequence of K feature vectors, is separately projected to the dimensionality of each attention layer throughout the ADM model and then concatenated to the attention context at each layer. So that's, we're using this twofold and that's why we're returning this dictionary containing both of these. Okay, let's continue on. And now uh, you can see we are adding to the temporal embedding. We're just adding this, this, this uh, projection. So this is this simple embedding vector as, per the, as the paper already mentioned. So we're doing this in the same way as if we were, to, if we add just a simple class information and not text. So that's everything remains the same as in previous papers. But the different part is gonna be how do we use this XF out? And we see here that we are passing up XF out throughout various modules of our UNet model. So that's the difference. That's how we are conditioning using the uh, temporal information plus the textual information. Okay, let's go here. Finally, the whole magic is going to happen here. Let's find a module that's actually integrating the um, text information. I'm not sure which ones are used. Let me just double check that. Uh, 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 so let's go to UNet model here. And let's find the model that's gonna be using the textual information. I think it's gonna be either textual block. Yeah, I think it's gonna be the textual block. So this is the part that's gonna be using uh, the textual information. The res blocks, so here is the residual block. Uh, that one is only going to be using the temporal information as previously, we saw this in, in previous um, uh, videos as well. So let's just uh, step over, whoops. Where am I? Okay, so the first module is not the attention module, so we're not hitting the, we'll have to kind of keep on doing this or I can alternatively hit F5 until we hit the first attention block where we're gonna finally integrate this text information. Okay, so we can verify that this is 512128 as expected and you can here see how it's integrated into the um, attention, so what we do with those tokens is we apply this encoder uh, uh, key value. So that's just gonna be a convolutional, uh, like a layer uh, applied. So we do some processing here first, and then we end up with a shape that's gonna be what? Um, one 
768, 128. So 128 tokens of this dimensionality. And then we're gonna pass that into the attention. And attention is this uh, QKV attention uh, object. Let me get kind of enter into it and let's just add a breakpoint there. So let's just see how the information is integrated. Uh, we can see here, so we, we care about this encoder uh, encoder variable. We form the queries, keys, and values the usual way using the um, image features. And now we're trying to integrate the textual features. And how they do this is, as you can see, they, they grab, uh, they just do some reshaping, and then they concatenate uh, those uh, textual, uh, basically, keys to image keys, and they concatenate the um, textual uh, values to image values, and then they just do the attention. So it's kind of bothersome. Um, this is obviously not the only way you can do it, but uh, it's basically uh, exactly what the paper here said. So the output of this transformer is used in two ways, blah, blah, blah. And then second, the last layer of token embeddings, a sequence of K feature vectors is separately projected to the dimensionality of each attention layer throughout the ADM model and then concatenated to the attention context at each layer. So we, we just saw that that's indeed the case. Uh, and let me just continue here. We don't need to go through the, this is the implementation of, of, of a transformer. I'm gonna skip all of this, assuming you already know how this thing works. And that's it. So uh, basically we saw how we are taking the textual information stored in this uh, dictionary here. Uh, temporal information and passing all of that through UNET uh, and forming the model output. Model output is again going to contain the uh, epsilon, so the noise, plus the uh, covariance matrix. So it's going to be 1, 6, 64, 64, 6 because we have three channels predicting the epsilon and three channels predicting sigma or the covariance matrix. Okay, so next up. So everything else remains the same as in the first TDPM decoding video I've done. The only difference here was the textual um, basically conditioning. Okay, so we split the output into two parts, the epsilon and the uh, uh, model var values. Uh, again, there is this V vector uh, that's actually predicted and then we form the model variance by, by using these expressions here. Not that important. We saw that multiple times in previous videos. And finally, we predict, so we now pass the uh, noisy image, the time steps, and the output, and then we just uh, predict the, the x0 here. Just some clamping, and finally we predict the model mean. So everything here remains the same as in the original, um, uh, as in the improved DDPM uh, paper. So I'm gonna skip all of this. And now this is where the difference will, will, will uh, kick in. So here we just a sample from a, a normal distribution. We create this non-zero mask, and this is the interesting part. So we now wanna see how the conditioning is done using the clip model. Again, this is very similar in structure to the guided uh, DDPM that I've covered in my previous video. So let's step inside here. I'm gonna hit F10. We are going to form the gradient and then we're just gonna shift the predicted mean by the, as you can see here, so sigma, the, the covariance, times the gradient, okay? And the gradient itself already contains the scaling um, coefficient, so that's why we don't see it here. Okay, let's hit F10, and here are we in the conditioning function. So we previously saw how we created this textual embedding. Now we're gonna do the, the fun part. So we're going to, take the input noisy image, uh, detach it from the computational graph and set requires squared to true because we want to compute the gradients for this particular image. We're going to embed this image using the image pathway of the clip, so such that we end up with embedding image embedding here. So that's again, let me show you what we're doing there. We're doing the, the drawing I showed you a couple of minutes ago, so I think it's somewhere here. So we're just now forming this red embedding vector, and now we're gonna uh, basically, well, find the gradients of the dot product between the um, text embedding vector and the image embedding vector, okay? Let's go back here. Uh, let's step over image embeddings. Um, so nothing, well, it's again, just walking me through the 
I have a bunch of breakpoints here, but we can kind of ignore all of those safely. Uh, and uh, what's this? My God, my God, I, I'm hitting every single, I'm hitting every single breakpoint here. Uh, nothing interesting here, nothing interesting here. So we form the embedding vector, we normalize it, and here we are. So we have the embedding uh, vector for the image. And uh, now we form the dot product, and we additionally have this logit scale. So we form the loss, and we just then apply, we just find the gradient of that loss, and that gradient is now gonna be returned, we just multiply with the gradient scale, so it's gonna be three, because that's the parameter we set in the main script, and we just return that gradient. But everything, so, so basically this is what, what we saw in the paper, and this is the only difference compared to your regular classifier guidance we saw in the previous video on uh, diffusion models beat uh, GANs on image synthesis paper. So this gradient is gonna move our image uh, towards the part of the space where that image resembles the prompt much more closely uh, uh, compared to if we were to just do it uh, unconditionally. Okay, let's step over here. We have the gradients, we find the new mean, and that's it, guys. Then we just sample uh, from that new mean. Again, we have this, this standard expression. We just have uh, mean plus sigma, and uh, we just uh, multiply by the, by the noise here. This is how we sample from the uh, Gaussian. And that's it. And this now just returns keeps on repeating. We're now gonna repeat the same process for the next time step, which is gonna be 98 and all the way to zero. And that's pretty much it. <clears throat> okay guys, next up I wanna show you how the classifier free guidance uh, works. So let me run the script text to image uh, and let's start. Uh, a lot of the structure is shared between this script and the previous one, so I'll just be skipping even more than before. So we're creating the model and the diffusion here. Uh, let me disable the breakpoints so such that we are just stepping over all of this. Uh, so we have model and diffusion, blah, 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 shifting into GPU, uh, loading the checkpoint, counting the number of parameters, then we are forming the upsampling model here, which we don't care about. So we're gonna skip all of that until we hit the prompt here. An oil painting of a Corgi, uh, and now let's start. So same hyperparameters as before, uh, same encoding of the tokens, and then adding the padding and the mask. And this is where it's now starting to become a bit different. This is where the structure starts to deviate from the previous uh, script. So now we encode the null prompt. So that's the empty prompt here, as you can see. And that's the part, let me show you again in the paper. So let's find the, uh, 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 okay, here it is, here's the equation. So we have to pass the uh, empty prompt uh, and then we have to pass caption. So that means we'll effectively have two passes through the diffusion model or in this particular implementation, what they've done is they've sacrificed some memory for a single pass for time. And so they basically do a single pass as we'll soon see uh, and they compute both of these uh, expressions here. So both the condition on caption as well as, as on the uh, empty, uh, well, null uh, caption or, or empty caption. Uh, okay, so let's go back to the code. Uh, here we can see that we now tokenize uh, the empty, uh, empty sequence and we end up with tokens we just contain pretty much just the, I think, end of tokens. Uh, so, so all of these, as you can see here, just contain um, the padding token. I think this is the padding token. Let me double check that's indeed the case. So if I were to enter here, so this uh, padded tokens, let me, let me just find that thing. I think it's gonna be somewhere in here. So there is a tokenizer part and we care about the BPE file and here it is. So you can see here, uh, because we have passed uh, empty tokens, we're basically gonna had the end token uh, for the full context, basically. That's what happened. So we, we have end token as the result here. That's that's what these this 50,256 represents. It's just a pad token. Okay. Now we're gonna store both the tokens as well as the uh, this un unconditional tokens. And we're also gonna store mask as well as the unconditional mask. So this mask is kind of boring. I assume it's gonna have all falses. Yeah, 
as, as you could have expected. Uh, and now let's uh, continue. So that's the, the, the key word arguments that we're going to use to condition our model uh, during the, 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 the forward pass. OK, so here we have an interesting function. So let me now uh, enable all of the breakpoints. Uh, we'll enter this one a bit later. This is where the whole magic happens when it comes to computing uh, the classifier free guidance. Uh, and again, we have the p sample loop, uh, standard stuff. Uh, we want to generate an image that's going to be, I think this is going to be 6464 uh, resolution. Yep, that's the case. And uh, let's continue here. We are passing the conditioning information here. And finally, you can see here that we are extracting batch size, which is one, whereas the full batch size here is going to be two. And the reason is uh, this is the optimization they've done such that they have a single forward pass and they end up with the with the result, <clears throat> even though they have to compute uh, the uh, the output both for the uh, empty uh, token uh, string as well as for the uh, actual prompt we're using. OK, let's now dig into the code again. I'm skipping some parts because uh, it's just boilerplate, uh, some for loops and stuff. So we are generating the noisy image. We're sampling from the, um, I guess, uh, normal distribution here. We are forming the indices. Again, uh, we have how many steps? 100. Uh, we are logging the progress, nothing fancy there. And now we're starting the actual diffusion reverse process. OK, so here is the, the p sample function. This is the important function. Really, nothing has changed. So the model is going to be a, a different here. That's the one that was defined in the main script. We're going to hit it a bit later, so you're going to see it. Um, otherwise, nothing interesting here. No conditioning here because we are doing the classifier free guidance. And this is the conditional information. OK, we're going to see all of that in a second. Uh, let me step over all of this. Uh, and this is where the magic of the uh, classifier free guidance is going to kick in. So here we hit the model function that we define in the main script here. So let's see what we're doing. So we take the input images and we just grab the first part. So again, remember that we have two images here. So let, let me show you the, the shape. So we have two. So we're going to take the first part only because only the first part is going to contain the actual information of interest. Uh, and that's, again, the consequence of, of the, the way uh, of, of them wanting to have a single forward pass, but like uh, sacrifice the memory and that's why there is this um, weird um, like burden uh, that we as, as as someone analyzing this code base have to kind of suffer uh, because of, the, of that optimization trick but like it's fairly simple basically you, you just take the first uh, part of the of the image uh, we we now just as you can see here we form this combined variable which is just basically copy paste we copy paste that first portion and now we pass that um, basically, together with time steps and together with conditioning information, uh, we pass all of that through the uh, unit with the transformer. So I'm going to disable the uh, breakpoints and just skip over this uh, whole, um, well, step over this, this, this function. Uh, because we already saw this in the first script, we are basically just um, integrating the temporal information, integrating the textual information into the attention context, etc, etc. And as the output, we get the epsilons and the sigmas for both images. So let's see the model output. Uh, basically, it should be 2, 6, 64, 64, because we have two images, 6 because we have both the epsilon and as well as the covariance matrix, so the sigma. And now we're going to split those, as you can see here, into epsilons and, and, and uh, uh, well, they call it rest. Uh, and then finally, we do another splitting into conditional epsilon and unconditional epsilon, because uh, as you recall, the first image is going to be um, conditioned here with the um, conditional information. The second one is just going to have the tokens uh, for, the, for the empty prompt. That's why we have these two variables here. So these two again are just are just these two uh, variables here. The the epsilon conditioned on the empty prompt, as well as the uh, epsilon conditioned on the on the uh, caption, on the prompt. Okay, let's go back to the code. 
And now here's the step, here's the actual formula. We have the unconditional epsilon, we add up the scaled version of this difference. And that's it, that's the whole magic. And now we just, again, do this, uh, well, as I said, it's a consequence of just this, of the optimization they've implemented. And then we return all of that and that's it. Everything else remains pretty much the same. We split into, we, we form the model variance, we form the, uh, let's see whether there is something different here. Okay, we just predict the X start or the X zero, which is the, I guess, um, denoised image. Uh, and then we do some pre-processing. So nothing fancy there. Uh, again, we'll only care, so this model output contains uh, copy pasted, uh, same results. So we only care, um, and let me kind of show you that's indeed the case. So the shape of this thing is 2, 3, 64, 64. If I were to take uh, all zeros, so that means I'm gonna just grab a single element from the first batch. If I were to take the second, uh, the, the same element from the second batch, you can see they're the same because that's how, uh, again, the optimization they're doing is, is uh, playing out. Okay, so all in all, at all times, only the, the zeroth uh, image contains the results of interest. The, 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 the second one is just basically a consequence of, of the optimization. Now they form the mean and then they return all of these variables back. And that's it. Everything else remains the same. We just, uh, we don't have the conditioning now and we just form the um, final sample by, by sampling from this um, distribution. Sample here is still two, Two, three, sixty-four, sixty-four, but only the first part uh, contains the, the so the zeroth um, index uh, of the batch dimension contains the actual information that we care about, and that's it, guys. I'm going to now go back into the script. I'm going to disable all of the breakpoints, and I'm going to set a breakpoint to show images here. Now let's hit F5 and let's see how this is going to be generated you can see here the progress is being tracked uh, using the tqdm library which is so cool and now let me show you the image so if i click f10 here let me show you the image so we have a corgi as you can see here so what was the prompt our prompt was uh, 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 let me just find it an oil painting of a corgi and you can see indeed this is a low resolution version of that particular prompt uh, because the models are already pre-trained for us, that's why we are getting the, 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 these cool results. Keep in mind that OpenAI has not open sourced the training code, so uh, we can only play with the uh, sampling uh, and, um, and generation in general and not with training. Let me quickly show you uh, what's gonna happen after we do the up sampling. I'm gonna set another breakpoint here. Uh, let me hit F5 here. And now we're generating the up sampled version. So if I hit F10 here, uh, let me just see whether that's gonna exit the program or not. Okay, unfortunately that exited the whole program. So I'm gonna have to set something here like print uh, blah, blah, for example. And now let's hit the, uh, 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 let's hit run again and we're gonna sample both the Corgi as well as the up-sampled version of the Corgi, although it may take some time. Um, cool guys, that's pretty much it. Uh, I know there is a lot of information in this video. Um, do let me know if you have any feedback. Uh, did you find this one useful or not? Uh, all of that's gonna help me uh, modify my, my, my future uh, videos and um, hopefully you learn something from this. Hopefully you like this combination of using paper, using code. Um, there is a lot of information, but I think it might be useful for all of you. So here's the Corgi again. This is the uh, low res uh, version. Uh, and now we're gonna see the uh, up sampled version. So here is the up sampled version. So that's it. Uh, I'm gonna quickly also show you how the um, in painting script looks like. Let me move it here. Let me try and run it. Let me see where the show images are. So I'm gonna set a breakpoint there, and then there is the up sampling part. But uh, yeah, I think we can just set a couple of breakpoints here to visualize what's going on. So let me hit let me hit um, uh, run, and let's see what's going on. So. First things first, after the loading has happened. So again, um, the logic is actually not that complicated. It's a bit harder to 
form a mental model for how this scene painting works, but I encourage you to check out the code uh, at your own pace and understand what's going on. So here is the uh, image we are trying to paint. So we basically have this grass image and then we masked uh, the, all of the rows uh, here. So I'm gonna exit here. Let's hit F5. Now we're going to generate uh, in paint uh, this this particular image. Uh, and let me let me now hit this. We're gonna hit this breakpoint here after 100 steps. So let me show you what we get as a result. We get a corgi on this on this on this uh, on the grass, and that's because the prompt we are using is let me just find the prompt a corgi in a field which makes sense and finally if i were to hit um well f5 here well we'll just get the uh super uh like the up sampled version but that's pretty much it again guys uh, do let me know whether you find this video uh interesting and useful uh any feedback is super appreciated and um do subscribe to this channel if you liked this video share it out with your friends and until next time bye bye